I would encourage you to take out your outline for this first session that's titled, The Story, Appropriating the Flow of the Psalms While in Exile. And again, thank you once again for inviting me back here. It's a delight to spend time with people that are serious about the Lord. That just brings much delight to my soul. The question vexing the exiles in Psalm 137, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? As I just alluded to a moment ago, I think this is quite relevant for us today here in the West. Our world is changing, and it's profoundly changing. And one of the most profound changes to take place here in America over the last decades is the increased hostility of our culture towards Christians. And it's resulted in our cultural marginalization, our exile. Now, our exilic experience is not one that pushes us to geographical margins, but it produces an exile to cultural irrelevance. And the status shouldn't really surprise us because one of the metaphors that the New Testament uses is that our home is in heaven. We are exiles. This isn't our true home. And our exile isn't because, like the Israelites in the Old Testament who were sent to Babylon because of their disobedience, our exile is due to being united to the one who was covenantly faithful, Jesus Christ our Lord. As one commentator who was writing on 1 Peter, which is a book addressed to exiles said, those to whom Peter was addressing became alienated from their social environment in a new way when they became Christians. Before conversion, they were much like their neighbors. After conversion, they became different, and this was the cause of their persecution. But for us here in America, this loss of cultural respectability is a disorienting experience for us because until recently, there's been a lot of evidence in our culture reflecting our country's Christian heritage. Uh, in many respects, Christianity held a place of privilege and respectability in our culture. But this process of pushing Christianity to the margins has been happening at jaw-dropping velocity over the last few decades. Now, our brothers and sisters in many other parts of the world, this is all they know is, is being in a position of exile. Since I've last been with you, I've had the immense privilege of traveling to Kenya and Egypt and Pakistan twice. And I've been profoundly affected, especially on my two visits to Pakistan, to see the church in an Islamic country flourishing and sounding forth the gospel message. It's been extremely humbling for me. They always thank me for coming there to teach. And I'm like, no, 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 I need to be here and need to see your faithfulness uh, to our Lord in these unbelievable circumstances. So the question to use Francis Schaeffer, how should we then live? Okay? There's nothing like being tested to reveal who we truly are. Right? We can talk all day about what we believe, but when difficulties come and when standing for our principles is dearly costly, well, that's when we learn what we truly believe and value. So this position of exile that we find ourselves in, how do we respond? What needs to change? What baggage do we need to let go of as we think about what is essential and what is not? What new postures do we need to embrace? And to think ahead to this evening's lecture, I think one is a posture of lament. We'll talk about how, as typical Americans, we don't do a good job of lamenting. We're the can-do generation, right? We snatch victory out of the jaws of defeat. 
And maybe one of the things we need to learn to do is how to lament and petition the Lord a bit more. Now, the good news of the gospel message hasn't changed, but I do think we as Christians need to make some shifts in our expectations and our responses. And I think the same biblical book from which this question comes, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land, also provides us with some helpful answers. And one of the ways that the Book of Psalms can help us answer this question is by providing us with a grammar of faith. Now, just like you think about what a grammar does, it structures a language and provides a way for us to talk. It guides our emotions and actions. And so, too, I think the Psalms can teach us ways of conceiving and expressing our relationship with the Lord, in particular by teaching us three points of grammar. Petition, which we'll see is tied to lament, petition slash lament, thanksgiving, and then praise. And I think the shaping of our faith by petition lament, thanksgiving, and then praise can in turn encourage us and give us the much needed hope to remain faithful while living life on the margins. And so we'll spend our time this afternoon, this evening and tomorrow looking at the Psalms. So on your outline, I give you a little background. Where does the name Psalms come from or Psalter? Well, they come from, a, from the Greek and Psalms or Psalter means song sung to the accompaniment of stringed instruments, okay? But that's not the title in the Hebrew Bible. The title of our book of Psalms in the Hebrew Bible is Tehalim. And you might hear in Tehalim the word halal, okay? And it's where we get the word hallelujah. So the Hebrew title for the book of Psalms, Tehalim means songs of praises. And yet we scratch our heads because statistically, there are more psalms of lament and petition in the Psalter than there are songs of praises. So we're gonna to wanna to think a little, why are these 150 psalms that we call the Book of Psalms called Tehillim, psalms of praises in the Hebrew Bible, when one third to one half of the psalms are actually psalms of lament and petition. I was delighted to sit in on the first session and hear Kim talk about the relationship between the Testaments and how the New Testament uses the Old Testament. The New Testament writers refer to the book of Psalms more than any other book in the Old Testament. And so by immersing ourselves in the Psalms, we'll start hearing some of those allusions and echoes that Kim was talking about, that we're just gonna miss, they're gonna go over our heads if we aren't immersed in the Old Testament, particularly in the book of Psalms. The Psalms are poetry, and as such, they need to be read slowly. We want to look for thought rhythm between the lines of poetry, as well as stopping to unpack the imagery, okay? The appeal of the Psalter. Now, Bibles come in many shapes, sizes, and forms, and one enduring favorite is the specialty New Testament bound with the Psalms. You can purchase one designed for nurses, soldiers, law enforcement, even babies in pink or blue. And there's even a waterproof version of the Psalms of the New Testament bound with the Psalms. I've yet to come across a New Testament with the book of Ezekiel appended to it, okay? Now I would love to come across the New Testament with Ezekiel appended to it because I'm writing a lot on Ezekiel these days. But why is that? Well, unlike a lot of the Old Testament books, which tend to be ignored by the church, down through the ages, the Psalms have been recognized and utilized and appreciated as a deep repository for developing worship postures, languages, and practices that are pleasing to the Lord. 
Now, why is this so? I think a large part of the appeal of the Book of Psalms stems from the way the poems of the Psalter speak to the various expressions of our human condition. And I'm not gonna read the testimonies here, except um, it, near the bottom I wanna read Calvin's. You can read them on your own. But I think Calvin gets right to the point. He says, I've been accustomed to call this book, he's talking about the Psalms, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of all parts of the soul. For there's not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to the life all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men and women are wont to be agitated. These testimonies underscore that the Psalms speak to us wherever we are, no matter what our emotional location may be. And yet, I think what we're going to see is that the most prevalent type of psalm, the psalm of lament and petition, is the one that typically gets ignored mostly by us here in the West. The shape and shaping of the Psalter. How do we get these 150 books? And then is there some sort of shape to the overall book of Psalms? So Susan had sent me some of the materials for Women in the Word, and one of the things that you rightly emphasize is the importance of context. Right? A text without a context can become a pretext to say whatever you'd like, okay? And, but the Bible's not a wax nose that we can twist any way we want. And so context is one of the ways that helps us to study a passage properly. And if you were here studying the book of Ezekiel this weekend, and let's say we were looking at Ezekiel 8 to 11, Ezekiel's second vision. We'd spend time asking, well, how does this passage relate to Ezekiel 1 to 7? How does this passage relate to what follows? But typically, think of your own times when you read the Psalter. When you're reading Psalm 23, do you think, oh, I wonder how this relates to Psalm 22, or 21, or 24, or 25? Typically, we don't. But perhaps, that would enrich our understanding of the book of Psalms. So again, how do we get this book of Psalms? Well, there's a lot of things that are very speculative, but there's a few things that I think we can say for sure. And one is, is that the book of Psalms is a collection of collections, okay? So turn in your Bibles to Psalm 72, the last verse of Psalm 72. And this is the sort of evidence that has led people to say the book of Psalms is a collection of collections. The last verse of Psalm 72 says, this concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. That's well and good, but if you were to flip through Psalms 73 to 150, you'll notice there are a lot more Psalms of David. Altogether, David um, has probably written about 72 Psalms, and many of them come after this. So it appears that there was this collection of Psalms uh, that ended with what we now call Psalm 72, and it was like, okay, now we're done with the Psalms of Jesse. But later, another collection was added with other Davidic Psalms in it. Or, and we won't turn here for time, but if you were to compare Psalm 14 and 53, you'll notice they're the same psalm. So why a duplicate? Well, most likely Psalm 14 was part of this one collection. Psalm 53 was part of another collection. And when this collection of collections was put together, we ended up with two duplicate psalms, Psalms 14 and Psalms, Psalm 53. So somehow these psalms were collected by, uh, under the superintending of God's sovereignty. And there does seem to be a shape to the Psalter. 
We're going to end today's lecture, th this afternoon's lecture in a little while, by looking at Psalms 1 and 2 as the gateway to the entire Psalter. And that's something that, the ch that has been done since the early church fathers, recognizing that Psalms 1 and 2 seem to be connected and they seem to provide the gateway into the rest of the Psalter. So Psalm 1 isn't haphazardly put there. It, along with Psalm 2, provide us with the purpose and the message of the book of Psalms. Over the last 40 years or so, there's been a marked shift in people who study the Psalms, seminarians and, and scholars, and, and they started asking a lot of questions about the unity and message of the Psalter. Can we read the Psalms as a unified book with a coherent structure and message rather than as an anthology of 150 different Psalms? And in answering these questions, I have been convinced by those who have said, yes, there does seem to be a flow as, as the title of this lecture is, there's a narrative flow, there's a story to the book of, of Psalms. As Luther said, it's a microcosm of the whole Bible. In the book of Psalms, we can see the entire story of redemptive history encapsulated in this one book. So what if there is a shape to the Psalter, an, an overarching unity and an underlying narrative to the book? Well, this is what we know. The book of Psalms is divided into five books. So turn back to the end of Psalm 41. Psalm 41. And you'll notice, and now I have an NIV study Bible, and as with Kim, I highly recommend study Bibles. I, I find them to be very useful personally. At the rubric at Psalm 42 says book two. So book one of the Psalter goes from chapter one to 41, and it ends on the words, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, amen and amen. There are five books to the Psalter, each ending with a doxology, which is very interesting because many of the Psalms in book one are laments and petitions. But there's always this movement in the Psalter from suffering to praise, from lament to praise, from suffering to glory. Now go to the uh, end of Psalm 72. We were just there a minute ago. And at verse 18, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse. Book one, two, like book one, ends with this doxology. Book three, and both books one and two focus on the troubles that David has had, either with Absalom and Saul or, or national enemies. So there's a lot of petitioning of the Lord to deliver the king from his enemies in book one and two, and a lot of reassurances that God will sustain his Davidic king. But there's a shift notice, and who wrote Psalm 72? Does your Bible tell you? Solomon. Okay, so we're seeing this movement in the Psalter from David to Solomon, books one and two. Now, book three of the Psalter, Psalm 73 to 89, we call it the dark book of the Psalter. It's a book of suffering and disorientation and death, both for the individual psalmist and the community as a whole. What happened to the glorious promises of the earlier books? What happened to Psalm 2? I will install my king on Zion and give him the ends of the earth as an inheritance. Well, you read book three of the Psalter, Psalm 73 to 89, 
And the Davidic covenant is viewed as something that's established in the dim, dark past. And most important, it's considered fractured. The book three is very, very dark. And you get this impression of a covenant remembered, but of a covenant that has failed. So book three, Psalm 73 to 89, the bar dark book of the Psalter, and Psalm 88 is actually called the black sheep of the Psalter. It's the one Psalm out of 150 where the lament of the Psalm never moves to praise. And yet we get to Psalm 89, the last book, and how does this dark book of the Psalter end? 89.52, praise be to the Lord forever, amen and amen. Book four, who wrote, who wrote Psalm 90 according to your superscription? Moses, it's the only Psalm attributed to Moses in the Psalter. And without a king, because the covenant is viewed as something that's failed, Israel falls back on her heritage. Moses is mentioned seven times in book four, whereas he's only been mentioned once before in Psalm 77. And his only song introduces book four here in Psalm 90. And if when you go through book four, the Lord is exalted as king. He was Israel's refuge in the past, long before the monarchy existed, and he will continue to be Israel's king now that the monarchy is gone. And blessed are they who trust in him. So a lot of book four focuses on God's mighty and gracious deeds from creation, his sovereignty, and his deliverance of the people. And then book five, go to Psalm 107. Oh, we'll, we'll look at the end of book four, Psalm 107. Psalm 106, excuse me. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Five books to the Psalter, all of them ending on praise. At the end of book four, in verse 47, we're, to we're told, Save us, O Lord our God, gather us together from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name, and glory in your praise. And notice how book five begins. Give thanks to the Lord, he's good, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east, west, from north and south. So the petition that ends book four, Lord, please gather us out of exile, is a done deal in book five. And you go to the end of the Psalms, and this is probably something you're quite familiar with. Book five doesn't just end with a short doxology, it ends with a, with a, a vast praise to the Lord that takes chapters 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150. So there is a structure to the Psalms. It's made up of five books, and there you can trace Israel's history in these books. There's a movement from lament and petition to praise, both in individual Psalms of lament, except for Psalm 88, but also in the entire structure of the book. And when we talk about how the Psalms point to Christ, we want to come back to that. I think there's a a Christomorphic shape to the entire Psalter that moves from suffering to glory, just as Jesus said in the New Testament. From the Messiah must first suffer and then enter into his glory. That's the whole shape of the book of Psalms. We move from suffering to glory in this Christomorphic shape of the entire book. So the five books of the Psalter, they're not just an anthology of 150 nice poems about the Lord. There's, there's a tracing of Israel's history with regard to the Davidic covenant. And intertwined in this tracing, it, there's this wisdom drumbeat about how the righteous, excuse me, are to live before the Lord. 
Now, a good question you might want to ask yourself is does this idea that there's a structure and shape to the entire Psalter enrich or impoverish our understanding of the Book of Psalms? Personally, I find it appealing, okay, because isn't that like the Lord, not to just have individual Psalms have a message for us, but for the entire book to have a message also that points to the glories of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First suffering and then glory. We're going to spend this evening and tomorrow looking at the three basic kinds of Psalms that there are in the Psalter. There's more than three, but there are three basic types of Psalms that I've been mentioning over and over. Petition, lament, which is followed by thanksgiving, and then praise. And this fits well with Scripture's own understanding. In Chronicles 16.4, we read that David appointed some of the Levites to minister before the Ark of the Lord and to do three things, to make petition, to give thanks, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Are all the Psalms messianic? Okay. You might want to turn to Luke chapter 24, And in Luke 24, it's the first Easter Sunday, the Lord has arisen, and we know that after Jesus walks from Jerusalem to Emmaus with Cleopas, that he goes and meets with his disciples. And they're, they're not sure, they think he's a ghost, so he, he says, broil me some fish. He took it and he ate it in their presence. And then in verse 44 of Luke 24, Jesus says to him, to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Okay? Now, the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms was a first century way of talking about what we call the Old Testament. Obviously, they're not going to call it the Old Testament because there's no New Testament yet. So one of the ways of referencing what we call the Old Testament is by its three-part structure, the Law of Moses, the Torah, the uh, Prophets, the Nevi'im, and then the Psalms standing for the last part of the Hebrew Bible, the Ketuvim, the writings. It's where we get the word Tanakh from, if that's a word that you're familiar with, the three parts of the Old Testament. So here we have Jesus telling us that the Psalms are about himself. Okay? And again, I think one of the ways that they are about Jesus is in this overall pattern moving from lament to praise from suffering to glory. We don't want to conceive of the Psalter as alternating between good days and bad days, praise and lament like a yo-yo, depending on how the psalmist happens to feel uh, on a particular day. There's always a movement towards praise in the Psalter, both in individual psalms of lament and in the entire structure of the Psalter. Put your hand at Psalm 150, and Psalm 1. Put your hand, Psalm 150 and Psalm 1. Actually, Psalm th um, 3. I'm going to alternate. I'm going to start at Psalm 3 and Psalm 146, actually. Psalm 3. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I'll praise the Lord all my life. I'll sing praise to my God as long as I live. Let's look at Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you, O my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. How long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? Now look at Psalm 147, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. Let's look at Psalm 5, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my sighing, listen to my cry for help, 
my King and my God, for to you I pray. Let's look at Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Let's look at Psalm 6. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord. I'm faint. Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in anguish. How long, O oh Lord? How long? Let's look at Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the saints. You get the picture, okay? There's a movement from lament and petition to praise in the Psalter. I mentioned this Christomorphic shape uh, to the Psalter. This movement from petition and lament to praise, it's not an accident. It's repeated over and over and over again in scripture because it's the pattern of life for us as believers. Listen to these words from Acts 14, 22. We must go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of God. You see, the present world is one of suffering and pain and crying out to God. But that's not all there is. Glory will follow. And it's not that the psalmist is simply an incurable optimist, okay? He's not an ancient Near Eastern precursor to Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy, okay? The reason for this movement from lament to praise and the reason for hope is that the fundamental, the re, fundamental reason for this is that our experience, lament to praise, suffering to glory is simply a mirror of the experience of Christ who experienced the same pathway, okay? So the whole book of Psalms points us to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've given you a quote there from Tremper Longman about one of some good questions to ask ourselves when we're reading the Psalms to see how they are in particular pointing to Christ. And we want to end our session today by looking at the introduction to this book of Psalms that has an overarching message and underlying unity. And we want to look and see how Psalms 1 and 2 are the gateway to the entire book of Psalms. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the ancients called Psalm 1, the gateway to the Psalter. And a lot of folks have since said, you know what, actually Psalms 1 and 2 together speak in symphony and provide us with the gateway into the rest of the Psalms. Now, most likely they were originally unique Psalms that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit were put together. So why? Why do people read Psalm 1 and 2 as the introduction to the book of Psalms? Well, first of all, if you were to flip through your, your book 1 of the Psalter, Psalms 1 to 41, you'd notice that they're, the, they're virtually the only two Psalms that don't have a superscription. Right? Psalm 3 says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom. Psalm 4 says, for the director of music. The psalms have these headings or superscriptions, but Psalm 1 and 2 don't. Now, neither do Psalm 10 or 33, but there's reasons for that. It's because they're each connected to Psalm 9 and 32. So as this introduction to the Psalter, Psalm 1 and 2 don't have these little notations that we see throughout the rest of Book 1. Secondly, there's all these verbal correspondences between the two Psalms. There's these literary features that link Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 together. So for example, Psalm 1, blessed is the man. And the Hebrew word there, ashrei, that's translated blessing, occurs at Psalm 1, 1, the first verse, and it occurs at the last verse of Psalm 2. Blessed, ashrei, 
are all who take refuge in him. And that's a poetic device in Semitic poetry. It, it kind of envelopes in a particular text uh, to provide it with unity. So the gateway to the Psalter talks to us about the blessed person. Psalm 1 and 2, as I said, they speak in symphony. Psalm 1 provides us with the purpose of the Psalter. And it does so by way of contrast between the righteous and between the wicked. And what Psalm 1 does is it teaches us how to live a life of optimal well-being as God intended us to live by delighting in his Torah. Psalm 1 teaches us how to live a life of optimal well-being the way God wants us to, and we do it by delighting in his Torah. And in Psalm 2, we're assured that this purpose will be fulfilled because Psalm 2 gives us the message of the book of Psalms. And the message of the book of Psalms is real simple. The Lord reigns. Okay, so Psalm 1, the purpose of the Psalter, how to live a life of optimal well-being as God intended by delighting in his word. Psalm 2, it's going to happen because the Lord reigns. And because the Lord is king and because he upholds his Davidic king, we're given assurance that the delighting in the Lord's Torah will not be in vain. The Lord has committed himself to his Davidic king, who will ultimately reign in the words of Isaac Watts, where ere the sun doth its successive journey run. So Psalm 1 and 2, this gateway into the Psalter. And what Psalm 1 does in particular, it, it, it's, it's a wisdom psalm, and it talks to us about how to walk righteously before the Lord. And it does it by three contrasts. That's something we get in the book of Proverbs, because Proverbs is a wisdom book in the Old Testament, okay? The contrast is between the contrasting paths between the righteous and the wicked, contrasting images, and contrasting destinies. So, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Now, you may have a version that says happy. I don't like that because it mutes the fact that suffering saints, including our brothers and sisters right now in Pakistan, they experience the blessing of God in the midst of their suffering. So I prefer blessed or how rewarding is the life of. And the psalm begins by three negations, and there's this intensification that takes place. Okay? There's an acceleration of the patterns of sinfulness. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, the counsel, the thinking, nor does he stand in the way of sinners, okay? a pattern of behavior, nor does he sit in the seat of scoffers, actually identifying. So we go from thinking to behavior, to identifying with the wicked. The righteous don't do this. There's also an intensification in the verbs. They get more settled. We go from walking to standing, and then we're just real comfortable sitting. And the words for evildoers also intensify in this verse. And the contrast can't be starker between what the righteous don't do and what they do do in verse two. The wicked despise the Lord in his way, the righteous delight in the Torah of the Lord. Now, most of us probably have our Bibles and they say his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's an unfortunate translation because the Hebrew word Torah is much more than do this, don't do that. It's a better word is catechetical instruction. It's teaching. I had the privilege over the last five years in the Anglican Church of working on the revision of the Coverdale Psalter for the Anglican Prayer Book. And I remember sitting in South Carolina with the team and the Archbishop and 
we were going over Psalm 1, and I was plugging for changing it to catechetical instruction. And the archbishop looked at me and said, we are not chanting catechetical instruction. <laughs> well, there is one woman who does, but anyway. <laughs> So, but just understand the Torah is so much more than law, okay? It's the whole teaching of God's word. And it says that the blessed one delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Here's one of those linkages between Psalm 1 and 2. We want to be careful because in English, or at least in the West, Meditation can conjure up ideas of emptying our mind, and that's not at all what the Hebrew word means here. The Hebrew word here refers to vocal activity. It's used for the growling of a lion, the cooing of a dove, uh, to moan or utter or plan. In other words, we can meditate with our mouths as well as our minds um, in Hebrew. And while the righteous meditate, the Hebrew word is Haggah, if you know Hebrew, in verse 1 of Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? Same word, meditate. So there's this contrast, the righteous Haggah, they meditate, they mull over in their minds and, and lowly speak about the word of the Lord while the wicked meditate about how to throw off uh, God's Torah. In addition to contrasting the way of the righteous with the wicked, the second contrast is the images used in verse 3 and 4. The righteous one is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Do you see the image here of healthy, vibrant greenery, flourishing, a tree characterized by life, endurance, significance? It bears fruit. It fulfills the primary purpose for its existence, whereas its counterpart, the chaff in verse 4, is good for nothing. Its leaf does not wither, a picture of vitality, a picture of Eden, if you will, where all of life is fructified by God's word. And then, boom, we get verse 4, not so the wicked. Three lines to describe the righteous. The wicked are dismissed, they're like chaff, which the wind blows away. The chaff the dry, rootless, weight, weightless part of the harvest. There's no value in it in contrast to the tree. The self-serving, self-reliant evildoers are like the chaff and cannot endure the sifting winds of God's judgment when they blow. And then finally, this gateway to the Psalter ends with contrasting the destinies of the wicked and the righteous. The fate of the, of the wicked they will not stand in the judgment. The psalmist here assures us that God will not confuse the righteous with the wicked. The winds of judgment will blow, the tree will stand fast, and the chaff will be gone. Their lives count for nothing beyond the grave as they perish in judgment. And these two distinct destinies are not the outworking of some cosmic karma. It's because, someone tells us, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And yada, the Hebrew word there, is not limited to cognition. I know that song that we just sang. It's relational. It's participatory. It's the word Adam knew his wife Eve. Okay? It's much, much more. There's a relationship there. And it speaks of, it often in scripture, of a protective sense, God's providential care and love for his own. What a blessedness to confess that the Lord knows us through and through, and he loves us. And so the last verse of both Psalms, one and two, use the words way and perish. Okay? The way of the wicked will be a way of perishing. And as one commentator put it, so the two ways, and there is not a third, part forever. So in conclusion, who is this blessed man of Psalm 1? If we read it as 
If only I were better, then these promises could be mine. We're in danger of putting ourselves under the crushing weight of the law. When, we were, when I worked on this revision of the Coverdale Psalter for the Anglican Church, in certain areas, we would replace he with one. But we were committed wherever there was a Christocentric impulse in the text, we would not mute it. Some, some texts will um, do that here. Um, there's one translation that says, happy are they instead of blessed is the man. But we didn't do that because we wanted to make sure that wherever a text was pointing to Christ, that it wasn't muted. Did you notice, as we were going through Psalm 1, that the comparison was between the singular righteous, blessed is the man, and the plural wicked? And that's because, on one level, there is only one blessed man who never walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of scoffers. There's only one man who delighted in the law of the Lord day and night, and that man is Christ Jesus. Now we noted earlier that Psalms 1 and 2 speak in symphony. Psalm 1, the purpose of the Psalter. Psalm 2, the message of the Psalter. Psalm 2 is what um, Kim talked about earlier. It's a, it's a typological psalm. So there's a historical referent there, but it also points to something greater. So it's talking about the kings of the Davidic dynasty, but neither David nor any of his followers or descendants exhaust the meaning of Psalm 2. You remember how the Lord inextricably bound himself with David in 2 Samuel 7. David, I'm gonna put somebody from your line on the throne forever and ever. And this was, and I think Kim alluded to this, God's way of fulfilling the covenant to Abraham. And here in Psalm 2, the outcome of the continued opposition to the Lord's rule is not in doubt, as the king's rule is portrayed as extending to the ends of the earth. Look at verse 6 of Psalm 2. I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Look at verse 8. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Well, that's well and good, but we know that was never fulfilled in the Old Testament. David never ruled the entire universe. And at the end of the Old Testament, where are the Israelites? They're a, a, a small province in the backwaters of the vast Persian Empire. They don't even have a king over them. So this is what Kim was talking about. This is a typical psalm. David is a type. But like he doesn't fulfill this. Like I said, he never had a kingdom to the ends of the earth. In fact, you look at Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from his son, Sop, um, son Absalom. How can you crush the rebellious nations when he can't even subdue his own son? Okay? But what we see is that this is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the one who rules. The Lord has installed him and the nations are in his inheritance, and the ends of the earth are his possession. The language in typological psalms like this, the language spills over its banks, so to speak, okay? It's gotta be something more than David. So one righteous, lots of wicked, but good news for us. Look at Psalm 1, and we'll end with this, verse five. The wicked will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the assembly or congregation of the righteous. You see, that's us. You see, Jesus himself, the blessed man of Psalm 1, the Lord's anointed son of Psalm 2, is our gateway into the gateway of the Psalter. Okay? And by virtue of what he has accomplished, and by virtue of our union with him, we are the beneficiaries of his covenant faithfulness. Everything that Jesus has accomplished and inherited is ours by virtue of our union with him, including 
experiencing the blessed life of Psalms 1 that is celebrated. Amen.